Thank you very much, Jeff. When we were putting this uh, panel together, we recognized that a large constituency of our EMD community is not only engaged in a dealer function, but also M&A advisory as well, the buying and selling of businesses. And we wanted to address that constituency, constituency as well. So I'm pleased to have on my left, Peter Hatches, who is a partner and president of KPM Corporate Finance, as well as uh, Richard Betsalo, who is a director of Crosby and & Company. And we are going to spend a bit of time talking about the world of M&A, recognizing that an EMD license is not technically required for M&A advisory, but many of our, our members do engage in both fundraising and, and M&A advisory. So perhaps, Peter, you could start off telling us a bit about your career path and how you got here before we get, in, got in, get into some of the more substantive uh, parts of our little fireside chat. Sure. Thanks, David. Uh, well, I did walk here. But um, um, so by way of background, I've been at uh, KPMG for about 30 years and really started in the corporate finance group when it's in, in its infancy in the, in the late 80s. You know, KPMG as a firm uh, is very focused in corporate finance and probably globally has 2,500 professionals, you know, operating across 60 countries. Uh, virtually all of our practices would be registered appropriately or to the equivalent of uh, an exempt market dealer here in Canada uh, in every jurisdiction where it's possible. And the reason we do this is twofold. One, you know, we're a big firm and uh, we simply don't take chances. And in, you know, transactions, it's sometimes hard to delineate whether you're, you're undertaking activity that's covered by the national instrument or not. We sometimes are, we sometimes maybe aren't, but we consider all of our transactions to be, to be covered because we consider them securities transactions, albeit in the exempt market. So by way of background, you know, our firm, in terms of M&A, uh, probably does more transactions by number than any other firm in the world, including the bulge bracket investment banks. We don't do the biggest transactions, but by number, we would rank number one and have ranked number one probably for 10 years in a row. Uh, but in addition to those kinds of transactions, we do raise capital. It's primarily in the, in the institutional market, although not solely. Uh, and it could range anything between a private placement, uh, like the mortgage bonds on the CN Tower, to uh, syndicate financing of uh, eight banks for one of Canada's largest car rental companies like Discount Car Rental. Uh, and in some cases, you know, we might be raising equity finance or other kinds of finance. Um, so, you know, we, we, take a, we take a very close view as to what we do and try to ensure that uh, at all times we're compliant, um, you know, where we have to be. Thank you. Richard? I am uh, Richard Betzlow from uh, Crosby & Company. Uh, I guess uh, I've been with Crosby uh, nearly 10 years now. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with our firm, uh, we're an M&A focused boutique uh, based here in Toronto. We're about 10 professionals, so we're sort of the opposite of uh, Peter's firm with his tens of thousands. Uh, but basically all we do is mid-market M&A. That is our bread and butter. Uh, that is what we uh, uh, eat and breathe uh, every single day. And, uh, you know, as, as Peter said, a lot, most of what we do doesn't really fall into what you think of uh, when you think of uh, EMDs. Uh, you know, we're, we're M&A focused and we're dealing with strategic buyers or private equity groups who, you know, in many cases don't really need uh, sort of the protection of, a, of an EMD. But uh, in some cases, it provides us with the flexibility uh, that that uh, that we need to to operate effectively for our clients, and you know as we get into the discussion, I'll talk a bit about you know a couple of examples of situations where we thought we were selling a whole company and we didn't end up doing that, and uh, it ended up us being an EMD uh, protected us and our clients uh, uh, in from a regulatory standpoint and allowed our clients to achieve uh, outcomes that uh, they were looking for. Uh, but just uh, in terms of my personal background, uh, 
Uh, I've been with Crosby and Company about 10 years, and prior to that I was uh, uh, at uh, a private uh, investment dealer, one of the small boutiques uh, based here in Toronto, uh, and uh, also with one of the larger banks. Uh, so my investment banking career has been about 15 years now. That's helpful background. Now, Peter, what, what's, the, what's your business model? Uh, you're obviously, you've said registered as an EMD, but do you spend... spend most of your time raising money or is it how what's what's the time split between M and A advisory, capital yeah. raising? Yeah, I think I think it varies depending on uh, the cycle we're in. You know, when things get a little more difficult, the M and A market gets slower, we seem to raise more capital or get into situations that might be distressed. I would tell you that on average, at least two thirds of our business is M and A focused and a third is capital raising and financing. But I will tell you that there are instances where we're in the middle of an M&A transaction, particularly on the acquisition side, and we're raising capital, either subordinated financing, senior bank financing, maybe private equity or equity financing. So, you know, we're careful that, uh, and again, it's, it's hard to delineate all of the kinds of transactions that we get into sure. because M&A has some financing elements to it. But I would say, you know, on average, two thirds, one third is probably a good split. Uh, that may increase if and there's a lot of distressed activity, a lot of refinancings in the market. And what are you saying out there right now in terms of uh, the cycle? Is it, people keep talking about this intergenerational transfer of wealth and founders of companies yeah. getting to retirement. Are you seeing that in terms of yeah. activity on the middle market and uh, family-owned businesses changing hands? Or is that just something that's true in theory but not so much? Yeah. Well, we've been talking about it for about 10 years. Um, I think uh, the demographics are certainly support that those kinds of transactions are occurring. I think we do see that as a group. In Canada particularly, I mean, we have about uh, 55 professionals uh, in corporate finance there. And across the country, I would say a good majority of our, you know, M&A transactions or divestitures are people who, you know, there's a wealth transfer. Um, a situation going on. I think uh, from what we've seen in the market, there seems to be a reluctance to have an automatic passage of assets from, you know, founder to uh, children. I don't think that occurs with the frequency it used to. Uh, and I do think the demographics support it. I think, you know, if you look at Canada's aging population, certainly there's a good number of us over 50 now. And, and we do see it. We do see it in the numbers. Richard? Uh, I would say, you know, in terms of our practice, we're, you know, similar to Peter's practice, probably two-thirds M&A, which is largely on the sell side uh, for mid-market businesses, which uh, we sort of classify as enterprise value between, say, 10 and 100 million. Uh, sometimes we do deals smaller than that, and sometimes we do deals much larger than that, but that's, that's sort of our sweet spot. Uh, the balanced third of our business would be split between uh, some financing, but also a lot of uh, advisory work for uh, different stakeholders, uh, public and private companies. Uh, we advise uh, you know, boards of directors, special committees. Uh, we do a lot of valuations and fairness opinions in uh, public company uh, contexts. Uh, and uh, we, you know, we're advising a, a, a variety of stakeholders in different uh, complex situations. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing in the market these days, uh, I think M&A activity is down. Uh, it's down quite a bit from a few years ago, notwithstanding that the conditions seem ripe for uh, a lot of activity. Uh, there's you know, the demographics that, that we've alluded to. Uh, there's a ton of money swimming around out there looking for a home, uh, both uh, uh, cash that's sitting on corporate balance sheets uh, that you know, we've all heard about uh, you know the trillions of dollars that are sitting there. Uh, you know, Apple being a great example. They're trying to find ways to get rid of their money. Uh, and then uh, there's private equity funds in the U.S. alone. There's 350 billion dollars of uh, U.S. private equity capital ready to be put to work. A hundred billion of that was raised in 07 or 08. So that's six-year-old money that's going to go stale. And in the private equity world, it's use it or lose it. Uh, so the conditions are right, valuations are good, and we're not quite sure why the activity is down, uh, but we're hopeful that things will, will pick up. Uh, interesting deals you've worked on? 
Uh, lots of interesting deals that we've worked on. Uh, you know, one deal that I think you know is applicable to sort of our participation, you know, in the in the EMDA is uh, a, a transaction that we did uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, where uh, we sold uh, a construction engineering firm uh, based here in Toronto. Uh, the owners, it was a single owner uh, situation, which is very common uh, for us. Uh, she went out thinking that she wanted to sell her business and then retire in a few years. Got out into the market. We got, you know, spoke to a bunch of the logical strategics. And as she started talking and engaging with these individuals, realized, you know what? I don't think I really want to step back from the business completely. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself, uh, which I think is something that a lot of entrepreneurs experience once they start going down that road. Uh, and uh, we ended up going another route with her. We ended up selling. Uh, a substantial portion of her company, not quite control, but a substantial portion that gave her liquidity uh, so that she could do you know retirement and estate planning, but allowed her to stay in uh, you know have a meaningful role in the company going forward and you know we sold that stake to a private equity group that was going to help her grow her business across Canada uh, and uh, acquire other other like businesses and you know if we Originally, we thought it was going to be a complete sale transaction where the EMD rules don't necessarily apply. Uh, but in the end, we ended up needing that protection because it's a securities transaction. You're selling, you're selling shares of a company. And uh, that's how we feel that this organization can help benefit us and protect us and our clients. Peter, how do you uh, describe the value proposition to a prospective client? I mean, I find that. Uh, the entrepreneur is typically not familiar with our world. They, right. like, I always like that to the, the guy up in Barrie with the yellow stained finger who makes the best widgets in the world. He's, a, he's excellent at what he does, but to come down here, it's intimidating. It's not in his or her comfort zone. Doesn't understand what you do really has been told. He or she needs an advisor. How do you? get them over the goal line in terms of describing your value proposition, explaining yeah. fees, because they all want to know first question, what's it going to cost? What's it yeah. going to cost? Uh, yeah. Getting to the engagement letter stage, how do you, how do you deal with that? Well, I think uh, there's, there's two ways to deal with it. First of all, whether you're a widget manufacturer in Brampton or, or one in Vancouver, I mean, it's a global market and uh, there's no substitute for competitive tension. To increase the price for your asset, uh, your business that you worked for and with for a very long time and your whole life. So, you know, when there's personal dollars at all, you know, meaningful and, you know, we're out to protect the interests of our clients, but to obviously maximize value. Secondly, I think, um, you know, that global reach, and, you know, particularly one of the strengths of, of KPMG and our firm is that you know our global reach is is very real we have a presence in every major country and sometimes in canada you know despite the size of the business whether it's modest or even small there aren't logical purchasers for that business in canada it's a very very common issue and so you know you have to look far afield to find the right purchaser to get the right value because sometimes you can't even consummate transactions without finding that that right buyer so we bring that to the table I always like to say that you know our 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 fees are effectively free. I mean, you know, we we add enough value that you know it's it's negligible to the transaction. I don't know how well that goes over all the time, but um, you know, when you when you look at it from a from a size of transaction perspective, I think while clients tend to be fee conscious, I think you know you look at the magnitude of the dollars that they're looking at and. And you'd hope that they could see past that. You know, I will say that what what we're seeing, and, and similar to Richard's comments, I mean, you know, U.S. private equity has billions of dollars of undeployed capital and are very active in Canada, more so, I would say, than Canadian private equity. But the fundamental shift that we've seen is that strategic purchasers are far more active than they've been maybe in the last five, ten years. They have strong balance sheets. I think they're on uh, a growth. Uh, certainly there's a growth agenda at most most companies, most modern corporations. I think they look at it uh, one way of achieving growth is M&A. 
and I think that uh, they look at it and know that they, um, they're not in the same kind of pricing frenzy that they were in 2007 when capital, and debt capital particularly, was, was very cheap and very plentiful because that is a big steam engine to M&A. Thank you. Richard, how do you uh, articulate your value proposition, deal with uh, fee issues and resistance and right. getting over the goal line to an engagement letter? Do you, do you exclusive well, versus non-exclusive? I mean, obviously... Uh, uh, well, I think we always go exclusive. We don't... Yeah. There, there's never been a situation that we've been involved with where we're, we don't have an engagement letter that's exclusive. It's right. sort of a non-starter for us. Uh, uh, in terms of the value proposition, I think, you know, Peter sort of hit it right on the head. The number one thing is to maintain that competitive tension throughout the process. And, and a situation that we often come across is that same, you know, business owner from Barry comes into our office and says, uh, I've been approached by, you know, company ABC down the road to, to buy my company and we've had discussions and they put me, they put an offer in and, They've done some due diligence, and now they're grinding me, and the deal's drifting, and I don't know what to do. And at that point, you know, you're thinking, well, first of all, you should have been in our office six months ago, uh, because you really you didn't maintain any competitive tension. When you when you have a bilateral discussion, uh, more often than not, you're not going to get the result you're looking for. And the the role of the advisor is to run that process on behalf of the business owner. And generally, business owners only get one kick at the can. They only build one company in their lifetimes and they only get to sell it once. Uh, and, you know, the lucky ones might do it a couple times, but generally it's, it's a one-time event. And you wanna make sure that you do it properly. And that involves a lot of upfront preparation uh, that the advisor should be doing on your behalf, finding out what the value proposition is for your company in respect of each of the potential buyers to have that global reach uh, because we're in a global marketplace and you have to be able to go uh, all over the place, all over the world, whether it's Europe or Asia or South America, uh, to reach the logical buyers who are gonna be uh, the highest value purchaser. That's what you're trying to find. And you're trying to create that tension and maintain it as long as you can throughout the process so that you not only maximize value, but you maximize the deal terms and the flexibility to your client and you force things to close as quickly as possible, otherwise they're gonna drift. And that, like that business owner who came in, the deal's never gonna close because that one-off buyer has no, com there's no competition. They know they're the only one at the table. And unless you run a process, uh, you're just not gonna get the same results. What do you think in terms of auction versus proprietary deals? Auction being what you've talked about, the competitive tension of approaching numerous um, multiple potential buyers or sellers versus going right to that strategic and trying to engage in a one-on-one a yeah. -on -one and talking to nobody else what's happening out in the market right now I, I think David that I think that's a very good question because I think you do see there's more strategic purchasers for sure than the market uh, and um, sometimes there are businesses where intuitively you know well, you can have a broad auction and try and undertake it. You know, financial buyers just not going to understand or be willing to purchase that business, given its size or its platform or the business that it's in. Whereas a strategic purchaser, purchaser, obviously, is looking to capitalize on the synergies for that business, so he's going to, you know, he's going to do it. The other thing is, you know, if you have time to work with a strategic purchaser and you get into a, a sort of longer and friendlier dialogue. You know, structure is important because structure adds value. It's something that we try to tell our clients that, you know, whether it's shares, assets, the tax implications of a transaction, there's dollars to be saved and entrepreneurs look at it, what's in my pocket at the end of the day. So, you know, I would say to you that there's more of those. I wouldn't say it's a natural, it's a natural inclination of ours. No, we like to create competitive tension for the very reason of creating price, but it does happen and sometimes you know, there's a logical reason for it to happen. Richard, any thoughts on that? Uh, I would agree with Peter. I mean, there's, uh, I think it's it's specific situations that you have to uh, consider the, the characteristics of that situation. But in general, you know, we tend to prefer to run a process, uh, you know, in the cases where 
you are having one-on-one -on -one dialogue with one particular purchaser, you still almost need to create that tension by creating parameters under which you're going to have that negotiation and say, look, we're going to talk to you guys for a month or two months and we're going to get you the information you need and set certain deadlines and say, look, if, if this doesn't work out, then we're, we're going to go to the market. And at least that way you've, you've got some leverage uh, in the transaction uh, as opposed to it just being completely open-ended. We're going to talk for years and you may never have to, uh, to be competitive. Thanks for that. We're, I got the two-minute signal, but one thing I did want to talk about a bit is I find that entrepreneurs really underestimate the degree to which due diligence is a distracting process. And uh, how do you help the clients with that? I mean, um, and I find they also, they don't understand it. They think once you've found, you know, they've signed the term sheet that, that sort of due diligence is over, but I think they're, these entrepreneurs are being judged in terms of by the buyer, especially if there's an element of the entrepreneur staying on. I mean, how do you view due diligence in terms, some people say, travel with an entrepreneur, see how he treats a stewardess, go to break bread, see how he treats a waitress, that'll give me all the information I need versus these personality <laughs> tests, Rorschach tests in terms of, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, due diligence in terms of the degree to which it's disruptive to the actual business, you, you obviously helped with that. Yeah, well, I, I would say, David, due diligence is the biggest uh, potential risk in any transaction. Um, I wouldn't rely on a breakfast meeting for due diligence, I can tell you that. Uh, what, what, um, what, what we do and what, what KPMG sort of takes the view on around a transaction is that, and this is common in Europe, vendor due diligence is often undertaken, particularly on large private company transactions, before they're brought to market. And the reason is you know what, you might as well find out what the issues are, explain them, understand them, and deal with them before they become undisclosed because that's an opportunity to change your negotiate price at, at the last minute. The other thing is, you know, preparation around that. And we have a big due diligence team that does that, different from my team. They do that work and it's a very valuable, but I will tell you that there is no substitute, categorically and absolutely no substitute for preparation around uh, a divestiture and, and identifying you know, where the issues are and what they might be, and most particularly, what the barriers to concluding a transaction might be, like approval or a change of control clause in major contracts, right? So I would say to you it's crucially important, not done well by entrepreneurs, left at the last minute, and often comes back to bite them. I'll give you the final word because we're uh Sure. Uh, we always tell our clients as we start down a process, we want to know where all the warts are. Uh, we want to know the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we want to prepare for it and manage it uh, because if things, if things are surprises, surprises never go well and surprises can either tank a deal or uh, negatively impact the outcome. And if you can manage uh, the warts, uh, position them in the light that you want to position them in and uh, try to offer you know constructive solutions to those issues uh, we find that is the best outcome for our clients and uh, allows them to focus on running their business which is really what they should be doing day to day the sale process is an all-consuming process and it really means that you know the management team may have two jobs but it's the advisors role to bear the brunt of that uh, and, and allow management to run the business so that the worst thing that can happen, which is earnings deteriorating, uh, doesn't occur. Listen, please join me in thanking uh, Peter and Richard for those very practical insights on uh, the